So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, out in Revolution Land, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm here with my friend Mark Manol, who is the Piaget ambassador based in Hong Kong, uh, but who is one of the guys that's most knowledgeable about the Alpha Theta development, in particular related to the 900P, which is the watch I have here, the 910P, which is the automatic version of that watch, which I have here as well, and of course the watch of today, which is of course the ultimate concept, uh, the world's thinnest mechanical watch at 2mm for the entire thickness of the watch. Mark, how are you, sir? Absolutely good. Great. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to speak uh, with you about those uh, pure technical marvels. Well, you know what I love about, okay, let's start at the end with the 900P, and I know this is a watch that was launched in 2014, and what I love about this watch is a lot of times when people talk about ultra thin, they talk about the dimensions of the movement, and then they talk about the thickness of the watch. But in this case, it actually kind of doesn't matter what the dimensions of the movement is because you actually integrated the movement into the watch in a very uh, innovative way. So the watch and the movement essentially are the same. And the watch's total thickness is 3.65 mm, which makes it the thinnest uh, mechanical watch, or was at the time. I think it would, oh, it still is, isn't it? I think, yes. So, uh, so Mark, can you tell us a little bit about this concept of integrating um, the movement and the case? I know that, for example, the back case is machined to become a bit like a base plate, you know? And, and tell us about how you assemble the watch, because then, you know, the thing I was thinking about is it must be very um, taxing and, and nerve-wracking for the watchmaker because he's not having the opportunity to put the movement together first and then do the assemblage, or he has to do it all at one, one shot, right? Indeed. You, you know, well, what was almost the most difficult uh, thing to, to, do, to do in this watch was to find a way to put it in our, in our database. Because basically there is no such thing like for the movement or for the case as, as it's the same. So, uh, joke apart, the, in the, the, there is no difference anymore between, between the, the case and the movement, which is a, a fascinating uh, concept. And everything started to, with the, the objective of reducing the, 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 the overall thickness. So of course you have different solutions and the solution will be to reduce the components. And at one point you realize that you are at almost at the limit of this. So it's not about reducing the components or reducing the, the, the space, the tolerances between the components. You have to, to, to move a step forward. And in this particular um, watch, the, the 900P, the decision was made to remove the main plate. So basically remove the main layer the, the, the surface, the base, well, the yeah, the, the surface of the of the movement, and using the case back for for that, which is pretty innovative. I'm, I'm not saying that Piaget is the first uh, company to do that, the first manufacturer, as it would be lying, but uh, it's probably the, the first one to push it into such um, such a, a fit, technical fit, and as well doing it in gold which uh, implies a few constraints for the, for the material, for the rigidity. So we had, uh, of course, to reduce the watch, but also make sure that it will be rigid, it will not break and so forth and so forth. So it's a engineering fit. And also what's very interesting is uh, it's one of the very few uh, watches where basically the case, as it's the main place as well, is uh, machined the, the same way with the same tolerances than the movement with such a delay delicacy. And what's very, very difficult with that is that basically th there is no room for mistake. If you assemble a movement and the movement basically ultimately is not good when you put it in the watch, okay, you remove the movement, then you do another one. Here, basically, if it doesn't work, that kind of mean that the, the watch itself is, uh, is not working which is not very good. And also there is the constraint of, uh, uh, well, you have to be perfectly uh, precise. There is no room for mistake because you cannot slide and scratch the, the case or whatever, because then it will be obvious on the ultimate uh, product, which we obviously don't want. So yeah, fascinating, fascinating concept. That's really cool, Mark. Okay, so I just wanted to reiterate for everyone that's watching. So in a traditional watch, you know, you've got three parts of the case to begin with. So you've got the back case, you've got the middle of the case, and then you've got the bezel, right? In this case, you only have two parts if I can, from what I can tell. So the mid case and the back case are one monoblock unit. 
But in addition to that, that monoblock unit is being machined in the interior, so it becomes also the base plate of the movement, which is extraordinary if you think about the amount of um, accuracy that you need to have this so precisely, right? Then on top of that, you're building the movement, so you're putting the gear train, you're putting the oscillator, you're putting the barrel. And then on top of that, you know, and also of course the hands are telling the time, but all of these things are occupying space on the same plane to minimize the amount of dimension that you need. Then on top of that, you've also taken several measures to make sure that this is as thin as conceivably possible. I believe there's 145 components to the watch, and Mark, you were telling me that you looked at every single one and you want to make each one as thin as possible. So normally gear wheels are 0.2 mm in thickness, but here they're 0.12 mm in thickness, so almost half of a traditional gear wheel, which to me is crazy. Right, And I think the important thing um, to point out also is that you would never be able to do this if you were a type of watch brand that was working with outside suppliers, right? So if you were going to try to tell your case maker, can you make me this type of case that can also be the base plate of my movement? And then if you were to tell your gear wheel supplier, hey, can you make me gear wheels but half the normal size or thickness of normal gear wheels? And then if I'm not mistaken, you have a suspended barrel in here as well, right? Am I correct? Yeah, the, the barrel is a specific construction. Yes. And what's very interesting, if we if we go one step further, um, is that on a, on a traditional watch, uh, as you said, there is this construction with the case, uh, bottom part, case, then uh, dial and, and bezel put, put on top of that. And also the, uh, on the 9P and 910P, we still have a bezel that will come and close the watch. But um, there is also something specific with the movement is that uh, unlike a traditional watch, the time, basically the movement was built surrounding the time. So it's not, the time is not the layer above the movement, it's within the movement. And by doing that, we managed to basically spread out the construction um, next to the time indication, not having one level higher. And also by doing that, reducing the, um, the overall th uh, thickness or thinness of uh, the watch. So that's also one of the of the trick. And on the 900P and 910P, we are still having two hands, but on the ultimate concept that we will also discover later, we removed uh, actually one layer as we still have one hand for the, for the hour, but this one uh, hand is basically put on a disc and this disc is put within the dial so that it's like still reducing. Um, so yeah, it's always like chasing for this, uh, I was about to say millimeter, but we're definitely not talking about millimeters here. We're talking about tens or a hundred of millimeters. And that's the, the beauty and beauty of that. And when you were th saying that some of the wheels are reduced and they're like 0 0.12 millimeters, it's insane. You take them with the tweezer and, and you, you feel that you, you have almost nothing in your hand and it's very, very delicate and, and still it works, it beats, it tells the time and that's beautiful to, to watch, it's amazing. I, I absolutely love it. And, and you know, the thing is, and what I find remarkable about it, about it is that in an age where everyone is trying to make things as industrial as possible, and trying to minimize the amount of human labor involved, right? So in a lot of ma watch manufacturers, what you have is you'll have someone will make the movement, then you'll put it on a conveyor belt, and then it goes to someone else, and then they'll put the dial, and then they'll put the hands, and then they'll go to someone else, and then they'll put the whole thing inside of the case. And then, but in this case, because everything is built onto the, onto the case of the watch itself, you have to have a watchmaker that's basically doing all of these different practices from setting the hands onto the uh, onto the dial because it's on the same level as the movement to you know uh, installing the gear train to regulating the balance wheel and then finally the casing the watch which i know you've done by um, the bezel being attached through screws in the back i mean that's a super labor intensive project you know so i mean why 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 is it important from the perspective of piaget to do something that is bringing even more work <laughs> Um, but I guess in the end, it's, it's an expression of your expertise in ultra thin. I mean, what, what's the objective here? Well, maybe we're just crazy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, I, I think there, there is like a, a, a strong passion. Well, you know, the, the motto of Piaget, I always do better than necessary. And, and when I joined Piaget uh, 10 years ago, I was like, oh, that's a nice motto, but well, what does it mean? And then I went to, to visit the, the watch manufacturer, the, also our uh, high jewelry workshop, and I was like, wow, okay, yeah, you are insane. And you were talking, you know, about uh, industry, I, um, industry, uh, oh, it's very difficult to pronounce for a French person, <laughs> uh, the industrialization uh, process. Um, uh, let's put it that way. We are not good on that, but 
it's it's not that we are not good. It's that the the the, the watchmaking, but also the jewelry philosophy that we promote is something that is a. Uh, uh, more exclusive, and and it's true that there is this profound respect of the work of the of the the watchmaker uh, of the artisan, no matter if it's a watch and if it's a jewel. And same could uh, you could exactly say, say the same for jewelry for jewelry or jewelry watches when it comes to the to the um, palace engraving that is still done by hand. So this is something that really uh, it lies within our, our heart. This respect of the of the the tradition but at the same time bringing innovation and and see how far we can go in the in the technique that's one point but also in keeping the tradition and the watchmaking tradition and our um dna i don't like the the word dna that much but let's say what we like to to express is uh, something about elegance and elegance for piaget is synonym of uh, ultra thin for a simple reason when when we were if we go back to the 50s we started like mostly doing um ultra thin almost solely doing ultra thin and also doing only precious watches that was the way to express elegance and by reducing the space taken by the movement you had space for something else and this something else at that time was what was directly above the movement. That was the, the dial. And by doing that, we could have gold dial, engraved dial, diamond set dial that needs more space, but also art stone dials. Ah. Uh, let's say like a, yeah, a normal um, brass dial is generally 0 0.4, 0 0.5 mm. Um, art stone dial will be 0 0.8, one. It can be even more depending of the of the stone. And by doing that, we managed to put a lot of colors when colors were not really uh, easy to obtain in an industrial um, way. And if we look at many, many watches that we love nowadays, the dial is completely oxidized. So the, the color uh, evolve. It has become like something uh, people like to collect which is great, but it's, it's kind of a default. And with the art stone, you don't have that. So that was the way we, we wanted to, to basically express the, the sunny side of life that, uh, that we call at Piaget. And then it went also in its own direction, which means that we're like, okay, well, that's nice. Reducing things is very, very interesting. The watch disappears, you don't really see it. Let's go as far as we can. And this created uh, Altiplano. So it basically it started in 1957. And then of course it evolved 1957 uh, manual winding, 1960 automatic. And then of course we continued, continued, continued. And at one point the question was like, how far can we go? And the 900P was part of, of this. How far, uh, how far can, we, can we go? What can we do better? What is always do better than necessary on this? It, it led to this uh, to this uh, watch that was quite a, a, a success. That was a real success in 2015 when we uh, 14 sorry when we we launched it. And I think we were like all extremely enthusiastic uh, after SIHH presenting the watch, the success, and we maybe got a bit tipsy and we're like uh, joking with our watchmakers about like, okay guys, you know you did amazing, but What's next? We sure you can do better. And they were kind of like, hey guys, from the marketing, you really know nothing about watches. Like saying something so stupid after we broke the world record, you uh, go back to your PowerPoint. But you know what? Uh, I think they took this joke seriously. And after a couple of weeks, they were like, well, you know what? We have some ideas to, to go even further like to, 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 to push things uh, even further. But that needs like a different construction. Are you up for that? And we're like, well, of course we are. And that's how the, st the story of AUC started, of Ultimate Concept. So that's, uh, that's great. Absolutely. Um, you know, Mark, you had mentioned uh, 1957 being when you launched the 9P, which is at the time the world's thinnest manual wine movement. And then, of course, in 1960, the 12P, which was uh, this beautiful micro rotor, ultra thin, 2.3 mm in thickness, um, automatic movement. And I think what was really beautiful was after 2014 and 2017, you guys came with the automatic version of this watch. And again, you had to be extremely innovative. So I guess the first thing that was the question is, well, where are we going to put the automatic winding system? And what kind of system are we going to use, right? So 
I guess if you were going to use a centrifugal rotor, that would necessitate additional thickness. But if you were going to use a micro rotor, that would necessitate additional space. And actually, you had neither of these. So you came up with a solution that I thought was extremely innovative, and that was to use a peripheral rotor, so a rotor that is mounted at the perimeter of the movement. Tell us a little bit about this development, sir. Yeah, well, the, the thing is that, uh, as you said, um, we had to find a way to turn the manual winding into automatic. Then auto, for the automatic, you need something that will move within the, within the case and that will be connected to the, to the barrel. The thing is that with the 900P, the watch construction is turned upside down, which basically on a normal watch, the main plate is directly below the dial. Here, the main plate has become the, the bottom of the watch. So what uh, is uh, below on a normal watch becomes uh, above. So everything upside down, which means that more or less uh, also, like if we put uh, uh, oscillating weight on the, on the watch, peripheral one, where do we put it? Above the time indication, which in, uh, most of the time when you want to read the time, you will have the oscillating in, in front of the time. That's not really user friendly. Then second construction is doing the same than the dial, which means basically integrated a, integrating a micro rotor within the construction. But this, you have no space. So one solution would be to increase the diameter so that you have more space to spread all the, the components. The thing is here again, you need to significantly increase the, the diameter of the watch, which ultimately could lead to a watch that is not well balanced, not elegant, and not nicely fitting your wrist. That's definitely a no-go for, for us. So. The solution, which was a constraint, uh, led by kind of constraint, but turned turn out to be a great solution, was basically to surround the movement with a peripheral rotor made of gold, of course, we, uh, with a non even non-balanced uh, weight, so that it will basically turn around the, around the movement. And what I really like uh, with this is that it's also increasing the, the watch, so even giving it a, a, a bit more sporty style, even though sporty is maybe not the right term, but like you, you see what I, what I mean. And also there is something quite captivating in, in the turn of the oscillating weight, because you can, you can see it, but it's not like, directly in in your face it's like it's it's here but it's discreet and i think that that basically summarizes pretty well the, the philosophy of elegance of a of a, of piaget so i think that's a that's a fascinating one for me yeah i love the fact that the the rotor which you see you know you can glimpse if you look just at the uh, the perimeter of the watch you can see it oscillating um is actually really cool for two reasons the first is because it's so large because it occupies the entire space around the movement um, it has a really strong mo moment of inertia, so it winds super efficiently. But the second thing is it all, you know, kind of gives you this, this really nice kinetic dial side pyrotechnic. So as you're moving your watch around, you can kind of see it moving and it reminds you that it's, it's living. You know, I forgot to mention also that because you were trying to make everything slimmer, you actually managed to make the Sapphire Crystal considerably slimmer on these watches. If I'm not mistaken, the Sapphire Crystal on the 900P and the 910P is around 0.5 mm, and for the AUC or Alpine Ultimate Concept, it's 0.2 mm, which is considerably thinner. Now, when um, pressure is subjected to, to these Sapphire Crystals, uh, they can distort slightly. And I know one of the concerns that you had was that they would distort to the extent they would touch the hands and then stop the movement of the watch. So what you guys did was you built up the bridge uh, the upper bridge of the watch so that it is higher than the hands of the watch and therefore will um, absorb as a block the sapphire crystal as it descends when pressure is exerted on it. Um, this is a really brilliant idea. Tell me a little bit more about this, sir. Yeah, indeed, that's exactly what, what we've done. The, the 0 0.2 millimeter is for, um, is for AUC. For the 9, 9, 900p and 910p, it's, uh, it's a bit more, if I remember well, it's 0 0.5 on one and 0 0.55 on the 910p. As it's slightly larger in diameter, we increase of 0 0.05 uh, mm. But what, what remains uh, um, as uh, um, identical on all the three watches is this um, safety, let's call it the safety system that was patented in, uh, in 2014 for the 900p. As the, 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 the glass is very close to the time indication and when you reduce the space between every component, you, you don't want ultimately to have something touching the time. 
uh, time indication, but that uh, the same applies for the for the escapement. So basically, we put everything that turns below the highest level of the bridge. So we increase the size of the the bridge, which helps us also to solidify, rigidify the the movement. But also, in case there is a lot of pressure under the glass to control the deformation, it will it will go on the on the bridge, but it will not touch everything that turns. It will not touch the time indication nor the the escape. So that's uh, the, this uh, patented safety system that we put on the 900, on the 910P, and then for AUC we pushed it e e even, uh, uh, well I was about to say a step, but that's more than a step, it's like a marathon uh, further. Um, as the, the glass has become 0 0.2 millimeter, so 0 0.2 millimeter, uh, if you want to, 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 to hold something that is more or less the same, just take your business card, look at it from the side, and you have to realize that this is the thickness of the of the glass. And if you want to think even more about uh, ultimate concept, the 2mm, it's like uh, most of the diving watches that uh, most of your collectors have, uh, AUC is not even the size of the glass of their diving watch. So that, that's <laughs> insane when it comes to the pro proportion. That's crazy. Uh, it's a very interesting perspective to have. You know, it's interesting also because you were mentioning that um, because there, I know there were other brands in the past that had experimented with integrating the base plate into the case itself. So one of those examples would be the, um, the tourbillon that was created by Audemars Piguet in the early 80s, right? But if I'm not mistaken, that watch, if you turn it over from the back of the watch, you could actually see the jewels where they were set to hold the gear train which probably means from a water resistance perspective, you know, it's not the type of watch you want to jump into your jacuzzi with on, right? So what I really like about the 900 and the 910P is that you made an effort to have these be real watches that have no compromise in terms of wearing them in normal conditions. You have 20 meters of water resistance, which, you know, you know, technical marvel like this is actually, to me, much more than enough. Um, and yeah, and so as you were mentioning, the manual line 900P is 38 mm in diameter, and then with the additional peripheral mass, the size of the 910P is a slightly larger 41 mm, but you're right, it's a perfectly acceptable size, a nice size actually. So let's go from there uh, to one of the most breakthrough innovative watches um, in recent history, and that has to be the ultimate concept, right? The Altifano ultimate concept, or as everyone calls it at Piaget, the AUC, which I love as well. <laughs> and congratulations, first of all, on winning the Aiguidol at the, the Grand Prix de Genève last year. Um, which is the grand prize, if you guys aren't familiar with that. Now, the thing about this watch is it's, to me, so much more than the world's that is mechanical watch, right? It is, and, and the moment you pick it up for the first time, you're almost, there's like almost like an optical illusion effect to it, in which if you're just looking at it, you would almost think it's two-dimensional. You actually think it's a picture that's been cut out. And it's only when you look closer and you can see that the balance wheel is oscillating that, oh, okay, it's alive. And then when you pick it up, it suddenly moves from two dimensions to three dimensions, which is the kind of crazy sort of dynamic tension that, that affects you. And, and it's wild, you know? But then on top of that, you know, as we were, we were discussing, Mark, yesterday, um, there's so many innovations in here. So for example, uh, the balance wheel is a flying balance wheel, meaning that it's only supported on one side, which is from behind from where you look at it, and it's mounted on ceramic ball bearings. The barrel is a flying barrel as well, you know, or a uh, suspended barrel as we say, but, but you know, but also mounted on ceramic ball bearings. But in addition to that, you've got um, the center wheel, right? And you've got the third wheel who are also, that are also suspended um, on ceramic ball bearings, meaning that they're only, so it, it, to some degree, you've got like a flying gear train as well, which I think is, is really cool. Um, so there, and it's probably one of the most ambitious watches I, I, I can think of. It reminds me a little bit about, you know, the, as we were discussing yesterday, the old uh, LaSalle caliber uh, 1200, which were, uh, it was like a, a movement that was like 1.2 mm and had like a, a hanging or suspended gear train, um, but were also incredibly delicate. But this is a watch that's actually meant to be worn and, and can be worn. So let's, let's talk about this. So tell us a little bit about this. What, what are you proudest about related to the AUC? Well, oh, it's, it's a big question. Well, first of all, the teamwork. I mean, everyone involved in this to, to, create, a, to create something. And that was a, a fascinating project, like hours of discussions and, uh, and, and from time to time fight and, 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 and well, joy and sadness. And from time, well, we didn't know if we would succeed, uh, to, to be honest with you. Um, but w what is is amazing is the first time we saw we saw the watch. Actually, when we we started the project, I, I didn't believe in it, in the sense that for me it was totally insane, insane, 
that uh, we could do something that would be two to mm. That would be basically the same um, thickness than the movement from 1957, but not being the movement, being the complete watch, the case, the glass, and everything and everything. And and when I, I remember very well the first time I saw the watch, I didn't even dare uh, taking it in my hands. I I didn't know how to kind of uh, how to handle that. So so then we we tried we got the watches in your hands in our hands and and we're like wow so yes it's here it works and then you wear it you wait it but you realize you have almost nothing in your in your hand and that's a very very destabilizing for me it's like you you see something but you feel nothing it's it's very 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 strange, but uh, I was like, wow, guys, you know what? You really deserve a, a big 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 club because you did a, an amazing job. So that that's why, uh, on a personal um, uh, point of view, I'm very very happy that we got the the GPSG uh, Aiguille d'Or, Grand Prix de, de l'Aiguille d'Or, uh, because it's really the the best tribute to to the amazing work of uh, of those people that we don't see. Uh, very often, and they are the real, um, real star, the stars, and they are to change everything because basically on such a watch you cannot, well, basically you cannot even properly transmit the energy from the crown to the rest of the movement using the the traditional technique, a traditional barrel that doesn't fit, traditional escapement that doesn't fit. So basically we have to, to, to to change everything. So what I'm trying to say here is like reducing the space, reducing the size of the component is, is something, but at one point it doesn't work anymore. You need actually to change your mind and create something new and new barrel, new uh, energy transition from the crown to the rest of the movement, new crown as well, new escapement and so forth and so forth. And ultimately here we are, the watch, works which is absolutely amazing yeah well you know what, what is also very interesting too and i guess one of the things you probably were a bit nervous about when constructing this because essentially the base plate of the movement is monocoque with the the case is this idea of rigidity and flex because any sort of flex that's subjected to the case means you're also flexing the movement and so you guys came up with using um, a cobalt alloy for this Right, which is one of the, 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 the stiffest um, materials in the world, but also creates an enormous amount of wear on tools. So just the case itself to get to that point um, was also quite a challenge, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the, the, definitely. And, I, and I'm not even sure we can speak about a case in, in the sense that it is, of course, the case, but it is, uh, it's a part of the movement. So we're really talking about the, the movement. And we tried a, a lot of different uh, uh, materials. The thing is that you need uh, two different uh, physical property. You need this to be, to be rigid, which means that doesn't bend, but you, ne you need the material to be hard as well, which means it doesn't break. And you could have like a hard material that will break. Let, let's say for instance, ceramic. Ceramic is much harder than, uh, than steel, but you, uh, you drop the watch, you're likely to have uh, many little pieces to, to put back together, which is definitely not what we uh, what we what we want. So we had to explore different uh, materials, and we ended up selecting this one, uh, the cobalt ba uh, based alloy. Uh, we, we can call it M64BC if we want to be a bit sexy. So <laughs> M64BC is the the, the case. And, and that's something that is used in a, a medical industry, in the aerospace uh, industry. Here again, for, his, uh, for its, um, for its uh, mechanical uh, property. So we use that and that was the first time we were machining such a, such a, a material which created a, a lot of constraint and, and difficulties, which is also why if you look at the prototype from 2018, the lugs are flat, but on the sellable watch from 2020, the lugs now are curved like a normal uh, Altiplano 910P. I was going to ask you that because I have the prototype and the watch and the lugs are flat. 
And as a result, there's a bit of space here. And I didn't want to say anything and be rude, but I love the fact that you addressed this. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, for the for in in, in 2018, we were not able to do that. So that, that shows also, you know, the evolution between 2018 and 2020, moving from a prototype to a sellable watch. Uh, and some people are just saying like, well, basically you just postponed for the launch of for, for, for two years. And no, there is a huge difference between creating a, creating a prototype, making a watch that does tic tac, that measures the time, and a watch that we can sell, which means that we can also um, repair if we need to uh, to, uh, to repair it and, and and so forth and so forth and we need to make sure that the watch does tic tac but not only when it's front of you it needs to 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 make tic tac in two years three years and so forth and so forth so basically between 2018 when we realized that everything was working together until today we spend a lot, lot of time making sure everything works on the long run, which means that we spend also time to destroy the, the prototypes and doing that on purpose so that we test the resistance, we, take, we test the, the breaking points. And with this, knowing that we will improve the movement. So just a little uh, anecdote, for instance, we have something that we call the infinite screw. The infinite screw it is the screw that's linked to the crown and it replaces the, the vertical crown uh, on the movement. So it enables to connect the crown to the rest of the movement on being on the same level. So by doing that, we managed to put it in two, mem, uh, two mm only. On the prototype on to, of 2018, when we, uh, we wind, uh, we wind the watch a few times, then uh, exhausting the power reserve and basically doing a, a, a fast aging of the watch. We realized that the, the wheel that was directly linked to the infinite screw was damaged a lot, which means that actually the infinite screw was acting like a, um, like a saw, like, you know, cutting the, the wheel after that. So. Of course, if you using if you use your watch not a lot, it won't be a problem. If you use it much uh, much more, it's a problem because we know that at one point the wheel will be broken. So, uh, as quality standard, we cannot accept that. So that's why we had to to change the, this. So we uh, explored different uh, solutions. Some of them were applying some coating on the on the wheel, like PVD, PVD, and using the PVD for its uh, original um, property, which means the lubrication of a component without oil. But still, so it improved the the the, the wheel. The but but still, that that was not enough. So ultimately, the solution that we do is a manual polishing of the infinite screw. So you have to imagine our, our watchmaker spending more or less five hours polishing the inside of this, of this less than one mm component. And that's, that's insane. Like five hours on this to obtain a perfect uh, mirror polish. And by doing that, you reduce the friction and that solved one of the challenges we had to solve. That's insane. Amazing. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your, your time and uh, your knowledge with us. Um, we're gonna have our event later this uh, evening and uh, we look forward to welcoming the guests, but now we're, we have so much more information that we can share with them. So thank you. It's a great pleasure. Take up good care. Have a drink for, for me and all, for all the, the watchmakers in La Cote With pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay, Bye. Bye.